Hello, I'd like to welcome you to Now Faith TV Ministry Training School, and I'm Carlotta Waldman. Thank you so much for those of you that are coming back. We're transitioning now. We've been laying a sure foundation and getting the blocks out of our own lives cleaned out so that we can be that healed person that partners with God to heal others. Amen? And we've prayed the crosswalk prayer. We've prayed many other prayers, and now we're moving on. We're moving on to how to minister to other people more effectively. And of course, these, each one of these teachings still minister to me, even though I was learning how to minister to others. Amen? There's always something in it for us. You know, God never, in my, in my point of view, God never just uses someone. He always loves the minister, first of all, and, and works through us while He's working in us. <laughs> None of us are tall and finished. And tonight we're going to be talking about one that is just very, very important. We're going to be talking about how we see God. And as we experience this third great awakening that I believe has already begun, amen, we're going to be seeing a lot of people come into the church or call us and even <laughs> ask for prayer, even considering going back to church like we talked about last week. And they're going to have problems and they're going to have misconceptions and misunderstandings and they're going to know a lot that ain't so, like my father would say. And it's going to be up to the, us to um, disciple, as the Bible says, we're to go therefore, you know, teach all nations, making disciples. It's going to be up to us to present the claims of Christ clearly. But not only that, not only to teach them the basic disciplines of Christianity, but who God is, who Jesus is who we are, <laughs> and how God sees us. And I believe that one of the reasons that we have difficulty seeing God clearly is because of our ideas about how He sees us. And we've gleaned those conclusions from many sources and not all of them accurate. Amen? And so tonight we're going to talk about that and how to minister to people, whether they're new or not so new in the church. Um, people that were winning to Christ who have been taught many, many things about who God is. And of course, they're coming from many persuasions and many religious points of view, and some biblical and some not, and some distorted. And some of us have been affected by that too. So I'd like to just begin with prayer and go right into our teaching tonight. Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you for one, are who you say you are, and that we can count on the biblical version of who you are, that we can be confident and courageous knowing that you never change, and that you are the one person that we can trust, that we can count on, that will always be there for us, that you always have our best interest at heart, you can only act toward us in love, that you coordinate everything for our benefit and make all things work out for the good, that you redeem every experience that we've had, and that you have a plan and a purpose for us that you've had since the foundation of the world, and that nothing takes you by surprise. And even though circumstances may not go like we think they would go, that your plans are always better than our plans. And I thank you, Lord, that we can rejoice even in trials and tribulation because we know there's purpose in everything that concerns us. That even those that we're concerned about in our family and people that we love and we're concerned about the direction that they're taking, that when they're your children, that they cannot run off the palm of your hand, that you have everything that concerns us under control. And I thank you that you're a good father, that you're not like the human beings that we've known that have disappointed us and let us down and even done us harm. But you are a wonderful Father. And I thank you that you're about the business of reparenting us. And so I come against every assignment of the enemy to tell us that you're not faithful, that you're not on time, or that you're not adequate, or that you don't care, and any other lie of the enemy. And I say that your word is strong and effective to not only divide us under between the thoughts in our soul and spirit, like we've been praying about, the thoughts and tents of our heart, but the next verse says to even lay there every creature, every creature that would rise up <laughs> against you, Father. And so I say every spirit, every foul spirit whose mouth comes against 
Almighty God to say he's not loving or he's not faithful or he's not adequate or he doesn't care any of those lies that they will be exposed. That verse 13 says that they will be laid bare and naked before the eyes of God and man. We claim that verse. We say we will not be deceived forever, that we will be the pure in heart that can see you, Lord. And so while we come against every plan of the enemy against us, we also come against every plan of the enemy against our pet's possession and property, everything and everybody that we care about in the name of Jesus, and say that all those assignments are canceled, and not only those assignments, but any backup curses are canceled as well. Every hex spell, curse, or incantation, I place a hedge of fire, a wall of fire, and a hedge of protection around us that no spirit can even ask or project over and say we're an entirely safe place tonight. I place the cross between even us and our own flesh so that for this hour we can hear and see God. That I thank you, God, that you give us credit lines all the time, that even if our hearts may not be that pure tonight, that you will let us place the cross between us and our own flesh so that we can hear and see you. And I thank you for revelation. I think that you're going to take the Logos word and make it into Rhema word and quicken it to each of us that we will receive what we need regardless of the mouth of this, this speaker, that you will be faithful to each and every hearer. And I thank you, Lord, that you are anxious to reveal yourself to us in truth. And I say that everything that we've experienced that has discolored our view of you, that you're just going to be wiping it away, you're going to be healing us, and every tension in us Every place that we need to be healed physically, emotionally, mentally, in any way, that you're Jehovah Rapha, and you will be healing us. I thank you, Lord, that you're a provider. You will provide what we need, and that you have our best interest at heart. We choose to believe you and your word. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I'd like to say that um, there are many times that we question God and I believe that that's okay. I believe God has broad shoulders. And when we question Him, that He uh, is ready to provide the answers. On the other hand, I also believe that um, if there's a big difference between doubting God and maligning His character. And so in the times that we've actually maligned His character, that we need to um, ask Him to forgive us for that. But we can ask questions. And we can ask God, where were you when I needed you? I mean, that's one of my biggest ones. Without maligning his character, it can be an honest question. But I want to ask you some questions first, if I may. When you were little, did you receive appropriate affectionate touch? Do you remember being hugged and held and sitting on your father's lap, for instance? Would you uh, say that they read stories to you or played games with you? or um, made an effort to develop you and invest in you, or was that left totally to child care or to others or to school teachers? Did your parents spend long hours away from home? Were you left alone a lot? Did they take the initiative to spend time with you, alone time or quality time, even if it was just once a week, did they? Did they affirm you? Build up your self-esteem. Communicate to you who you really are so that you can take pride in who you are and who God's created you to be. Or did you feel often criticized and cut down, misunderstood, or even like the black sheep of the family? Could you confide in them and know that your opinions or their feelings or your emotions or your concerns were valid and were respected? Did they discipline you appropriately? Did you feel like, even though you wouldn't like the spanking, you may complain, <laughs> that, um, that they were fair, that they tried to um, raise you in the way that you should go? Or were they unpredictable or even capricious? Many Christians have problems coming into relationship with God because they can't conceive it because they haven't really learned that much about relationships, much less bonding. I'm very concerned about the generations that are being raised now because people that are old as I am, you know, we had a mother at home and we were able to bond. But many children have never experienced a mother at home and when they grow up spending time in child care, most of their time in child care, and that caregiver changes every few months. They simply learn not to bond. 
But back to our subject tonight. I believe that God has a lake of blessing that always is flowing toward us, but sometimes we have a log jam in our hearts. And so that's why we've spent, you know, the first eight weeks trying to get that log jam removed so that we can stand under the fountain, <laughs> the waterfall of God's blessing, and receive it. And also we will know if we're not standing under it, then we can move back under it. But children form inaccurate views of what God is like because of how other human beings treat them. And it's not just children. Um, an extreme story that I was touched by was uh, when I was having dinner with a Jewish couple and he told me that he was the only survivor from the Holocaust. Um, he and his aunt were the only survivors out of 72 relatives and it was almost impossible for him to relate to God at all. That story doesn't need explaining, does it? All I could say, you know, even Carlotta was almost speechless and we had had dinner with them every night for a week because of the uh, cruise we were on. But all I could say was that just really shows me how important it is how we treat each other. Because even though um, they weren't his parents, you know, significant people in your life give you a view of what God is like. Some of you have written me and have said that, you know, you're having trouble relating to God because of how church people have treated you or how pastors have treated you and the message that they preach which isn't the true gospel. Many of us kept angers inside so long and learned to stuff them so well that we don't even feel consciously concerned about this subject. We just know that we can't relate to God that well. But we, when we read things like Matthew 5, 8 that says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. A lot of people there are believers, sincere, devoted believers, can't relate to that. They don't feel like they see God in any shape or form. Not even thinking about literally, but not even hearing God or seeing God or seeing vision or having spontaneous thoughts from God or anything. And um, the Bible says that by this love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. But there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. And fear may have characterized the messages that you got from parents, or from others, teachers, coaches, leaders, or from pastors. And you certainly weren't perfected in love around them. And, um, and now, you're having trouble relating to God. Maybe it's almost like, they put colored glasses on you. You know how many of the sunglasses more predominantly used to be green and so everything you looked at looked like a shade of green. And But some of us are that way. It's like we grew up with green colored glasses on and, and we think God is kind of a green monster even um, and not realizing that our perspective is not right, that it's been tinted. Well, We've worked through our attitudes and our reactions toward our parents. We've confessed that. You might say, I've done all that and I'm still not that able to trust God. Let me see if some of these, um, some of these reactions to parents ring home with anybody, just in case there's anything left that needs to be prayed about. Did you ever feel like saying to your parents, I don't know, as soon as I get home, I just feel like you're ready to jump me. Or you're not fair. Or, I don't even think you care about me. Or, you're just playing favorites. You like my brother or my sister much better than me. Why would you let me do anything? I don't even think you understand how important this is to me. This is my whole life that I get to do this. Or everyone else gets to do it. I don't know why my parents don't care. Or, you've broken promise after promise after promise. I don't know if you even love me. Or he started it. Why are you punishing me? But I need to go. It's not that I want to go. I have to go or I'll be a failure. You don't even love me. You don't take time for me. You're not there for me. You don't even know what's going on in my life. Or you're just too strict. You are too strict. I can't even breathe in this house. Well, if any of those <laughs> sounded like your home, 
just make sure that you've already prayed the crosswalk prayer and have it taken care of. But you, some of you will be saying also, I'm not conscious of having been angry at my parents. I don't have a feeling of resentment or bitterness or anger in those things that you've prayed about. And I want to say that if the Holy Spirit convicts you of something, it doesn't mean that you have to have a conscious feeling. Feelings aren't required in this. If you can remember the incident, just go ahead and pray and be safe rather than sorry. So we grow into adulthood and we need to make sure that we put these childish ways behind us. And there are many of our beliefs about God that may still need updating even though we've repented and renounced and broken the power of our judgments and our bitter root expectations and inner vows and dishonor of parents. Parents, especially fathers, are supposed to build a child's spirit. We learn who we are, who we are in general, and especially who we are in Christ, on our Father's lap, really. We learn whether we're valuable, contributing members of the community, of the body of Christ, in the church, whether we have potential, whether our emotions, feelings, preferences, opinions are valid, whether it's safe to be me and to be real, or whether it's not. So what we need to do is put these childish reactions away, renounce and repent, but then we need to come to that place where we're not interpreting God by the way authority figures, parents, other leaders, teachers, coaches, other people in the community have treated us and look at the Bible to see who God really is and choose to believe what the Bible says instead of what we have experienced with human beings. I've, I'll say it over and over again, the most powerful thing we can do is choose to believe something and then believe, <laughs> believe again, that God will finish that which He's begun in us. Many times we're relating to God because we have anticipatory behavior John Sanford says, we have learned to anticipate certain things. Some of us, like my personality style, I like to test the environment and see what kind of reaction I'm going to get before I even step out, amen? Others just anticipate criticism. Their biggest concern is to be cons whether they'll be criticized. Others, their greatest concern is whether they'll be rejected. Others need to be exactly right. Other personality styles like things to be steady and secure, no matter what. And others are just foraging ahead and don't even notice the other people. They're so motivated. But some of you have had experiences where, say, your parents weren't bad at all. They were just distant. Maybe your father lived in front of a TV and you don't really know what he thought. Others... Um, we're just simply never thanked or praised or complimented and you don't know whether they believed in you or not. Maybe they did. Maybe they were very stoic but there wasn't much said about it. But you may have still drawn a conclusion that he doesn't care and your view of God is that he's not that involved. He's distant. Some motivated you with guilt and with fear and today it's hard for you to receive and relax in people's love and affection to believe people really will care and believe in you and in your vision and invest in you because you have this bitter root expectation that you won't be noticed, that you're just kind of invisible, that you won't be chosen. Others had a parent that was just very busy and you got the impression that um, you don't count, that you're not nearly as important, um, that your priorities aren't their priorities and you just do the best you can or you feel like you have to uh, take care of yourself. Sometimes though the people that have difficulty relating to God, seeing God or hearing God are the pastors themselves. They, they're people too and they had uh, reactions and they had parents that were difficult. For instance, John Sanford tells the story of um, a pastor that came for ministry and he wasn't quite sure what, it, what the root of it was, why, why he had difficulty relating to God and he's the pastor and he was so nervous in church and he was so afraid that someone would make a mistake in church and it was hard for him to relax and just go with the flow 
and he was horrified of the Holy Spirit. He was horrified, quote, of the Holy Spirit getting loose in his church. And they were like, what is this about? And they began to ask him a very valuable question that I want to pass on to you. When you're not sure what to pray for someone, but they're letting you know that there's this bad fruit in their life, and you're asking God, what is the bad root? What is it I need to pray about? Instead of just the surface issue, ask them, what was your father like? Or, what was your father and mother like? You will be surprised. The Holy Spirit will take them to the instance in their life that relates to this situation. He will just connect it, and whatever he reveals, he will take care of. And so whatever he reveals in the back, um, in back parts of their heart or <laughs> in the childhood or early, um, maybe in school days, he will heal not only that, but everything between that and the fear or the doubt or the problem that they're having today. Whatever he reveals, he will take care of. And in this story, this pastor that was so fearful of people making mistakes in church, afraid of the Holy Spirit, he began to he began to tell them this story. He said, when I was growing up, I was the only child, and my parents bought me a dog so I wouldn't be alone. And he says, later on, the dog was playing with me and um, a couple little girls in the house, and we got rambunctious, and the dog got rambunctious. And you know, if you get rambunctious with animals, sometimes things happen. And he said the dog just kind of jumped up, and his teeth nicked one of the little girls, and it actually drew blood, but he wasn't trying to do any harm. You know, he's just a puppy. Well, when the, his father got home, he said, my mother told my father what had happened, and um, that she was concerned because it actually drew blood. And he said, my father just glared at me, just glared at me, did not say a word, went to his bedroom, into the bureau, got a revolver, came right back out, and shot the dog dead. Well, naturally, that was extremely wounding to him. It was not only unpredictable, it was like capricious, completely seemed like uncalled for behavior. This is just a puppy, wasn't trying to do any harm. The children need to be instructed not to get rambunctious with him. Well, it caused him so much damage. It just really hurt his heart so badly to witness that. And John told him, he said, that's it. That's it. That's why you're afraid of the Holy Spirit. That's why you're so afraid of someone making mistakes in the church. That's why you're afraid to go into these new areas with the Holy Spirit. Because in your point of view as a child, God would let this happen. You know, God might be like your father, that if you make a mistake, he'll just pull out his gun and shoot you dead. And he said, um, Pastor, would you be willing to let the Holy Spirit minister to that seven-year-old boy in you right now? Now, I don't think he was real familiar with prayers like that. But he said yes, and he immediately started sobbing, and he sobbed, and he sobbed, and he couldn't stop, and it just went on for minutes, longer, much longer than he thought. And finally, when he could catch his breath, he said, why am I crying so hard? He said, this is the seven-year-old boy that was trained that boys don't cry, and never got to grieve over this puppy, and has been scared to death of his father and God ever since. Then he asked him if he'd be willing to forgive his father. That was hard. He had to think about it for a while, and finally, with a lot of strain in his voice, he said, Okay, I forgive it. And John said, I'll take that. I'll take that. Well, the result of that was he went on to preach a series of nine sermons about the Holy Spirit. He could have the joy of inviting God to be God in his church. He didn't have to feel like he had to be in control of everything that happened, that ultimately God is in control, and he could rest in the goodness of Father God and the Holy Spirit to be in charge. And the church was able to move on. And then, after that, if somebody did make a mistake in church, if something didn't go quite right, he was able to just giggle because he knew the ultimate responsibility of controlling the universe is on Father God. Amen? So he was healed. And we can be healed too. God wants to heal every last one of us. So whether you've uh, felt like that 
you were motivated by fear and guilt and that's distorted your view or whether God was distant, whether he's capricious and he might just punish you in an uncalled for way, whether he's busy and your priority, you just weren't a priority, you can take whatever you got from that, whether it's shame or rejection or feeling like you're a failure and you don't deserve anything but punishment, you can take that to God. You can take the fear and doubts and just ask Him to take it away. It's that simple. Again, we just make a choice and He does like 99% of the work. So, whether you see God as a dominating God, maybe macho, maybe your father was an alcoholic and you couldn't be real, you couldn't cry, you couldn't be sensitive to others, you just didn't even learn how to from Him. Maybe he was intimidating. You were hesitant to even ask for what you wanted, share your feelings, how to be, you didn't know how to be real. Maybe it wasn't safe to even point out there was a problem or to say much of anything. Maybe you've turned out indecisive and it's hard for you to make a decision because his discipline, if you want to call it that, could easily turn into this capricious type of punishment. Maybe you can relate to a lot of these, but I hope you're taking it to the Lord and believing that He will actually um, take care of it, that He will heal whatever He reveals, whatever He's bringing to your mind right now, He will heal. So whether He was liberal and you learn that God doesn't really care what I do and I can do most anything I wanted, for instance, there was a lady that I could relate to. She had difficulty with relationships, she had difficulty making decisions. And yet she had difficulty feeling like she really needed to be accountable to God. And they asked her, what was your father like? And she said, well, I had a lot of issues with my mother. We got into all kinds of fights and we've made up now and we've forgiven each other and it's okay. But she said, I didn't have any issues with my father. He was my best buddy and he never got mad at me. In fact, I could just do anything I wanted. And even as she said it, she heard herself that her view of God was that you didn't have to be accountable you can do most anything you want. I hope that tonight God is showing you some cause and effect. He's showing you that if, if you feel like um, you can't be real with God, that, that maybe you came by it honestly, but He can redeem that experience, take the pain out of it, and He is renewing our minds and transforming us. Amen? All we need to do is say, God, whatever it is, you know, I'm impulsive, I pop off easily, I get mad easily, um, I can't hear you when I want to, or maybe you're the other way, maybe you're self-critical and you don't believe in yourself and you reject yourself and you feel like you're unnecessary. Whatever it is that's not God's definition of who you are and who God is, bring it to Him and ask Him to heal and correct it. So we can choose. We can choose. If we have been looking for love in all the wrong places, or we've been looking for love even in church and didn't find it, we can ask God to forgive us for looking in these other places to find His love and say, God, show me how to search for you with all my heart. Show me how to be one with you. Show me that union that you've promised. Show me the Father's love. Some of you probably should even go to one of the bottom links on my website at wcwlinc.com down toward the bottom where it uh, talks about the Father's love letter down toward the bottom there one earring fell out so I'll just go ahead and take the other one out so I won't just have one earring <laughs> read the Father's love letter again read it again and see if you're able to believe it and if if you have some problem areas, just look up those verses. But tonight also, I want to talk to you about where God has been taking me and who I believe God is. And I believe, um, while you may only relate to some of these, because this is my journey, I believe that God is teaching me who He is partly by showing me who His Word says I am. Now, if you need... A, a big printout on verses of who you are in Christ. I've got 15 pages worth typed out. You can order those from me.